please welcome Andrew Roth Sorkin and his guest, former Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Kevin McCarthy. I want to uh, welcome Kevin McCarthy, Congressman, uh, former uh, Speaker of the House, uh, served, of course, uh, his district in uh, California for nearly two decades thus far. Fifty-seven days ago, though, as we all know, uh, on October 4th, uh, he became the first speaker in history to be ousted from the job. And we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the politics of this moment, uh, the upcoming election, what's happening in the party, and where you think this country is going, and maybe some lessons learned. Maybe you can be unplugged now uh, <laughs> okay. a little bit. Here's where I just want to start with this, and maybe you can just take us inside the room. When you were ousted, when this all happened, uh, when you decided uh, uh, to push uh, for this deal, what did you what did you think was going to happen? Well, let's... did you did you know this was going to happen? Yes, yes. It took me 15 rounds to win speaker. That hasn't happened since the 1800s. Um, I knew that was going to be a challenge the night of the election. I always understood if I didn't win a 20-seat majority, we'd have a difficult time. The thing you have to understand about politics, and it's hard for you, you get to hire and fire who works with you. Somebody else hires and fires who works with me. I just have to inspire them. So there's some people I can inspire, and there's some people I need to get medication for. But it's just what we need to do, okay? So this is the challenge. And I have one person who drove this that had nothing to do about being conservative or politics. It's an ethics complaint that he has. I can't be involved in that. You're talking about Matt Gates. Yes. And if you think about this, we have a four-seat majority, but I had five people who never voted for me. We have a, something that is called a motion to vacate. It's been around for hundreds of years. The only time it was changed was when Pelosi came in and she changed it where just the, speak, just the minority leader could move it on or not. Um, Boehner left because of it, because someone made a motion to vacate but didn't go to the floor. Um, Pelosi promised that she would have tabled that, but he just didn't want to go through it anymore. Paul Ryan comes in. They have dinner the first night, and Pelosi says... Don't worry about the motion to vacate. We'll never let it happen. We win the majority in November, about to be elected um, in January. Pelosi and I are at this event. She's asking, how's it going, putting the votes together? I said, I got a problem. Um, probably going to have to go back to the motion to vacate. She said, Give it to him. Give it to him. We'll never let that happen. Right? And in the end of the day, the 15 rounds, you have to have 218 votes. You had to have it. I've had a number of Democrats say it wouldn't happen, but... I knew that at the end of the day, they were going to make a political decision. Um, I'm fortunate enough as leader. I've been leader for five years. It's been a tough time for Republicans when you say the last two election cycles. We lost the presidency. The Senate lost both cycles. The governors and the legislature. But you know, in the House, we've never lost. We've only won. And it's an interesting take. I became leader when we took the minority. And th this was a turning point for me. I go into the State of the Union. And in the State of the Union, one side stands up and the other side stands up. And I just become leader. And I'm excited. And President Trump's there. And I look over at the Democrats and they stand up. They look like America. We stand up. We look like the most restrictive country club in America. And I decide then either I am going to be the leader of a declining end of a party or I have to change the opportunity in this party. So I embrace in something else, okay? Since that time, we've elected the most women, Republicans, the most minority Republicans ever to the House. But to do so, I'm going to have to ruffle feathers. So for a Republican woman or a Republican minority to win, the, the November election is not their tough election. It's the primary. So what I do is I would engage in primaries. And I would help. And it, sometimes you lose some, sometimes you have problems in, in the end. But in terms of the Matt Gates of it all, mm -hmm. in terms of going back, do you, I mean, it, if you could do this all over again, do you think you could have built a different relationship with these people that I think you think need medication? I jokingly say I should have got a psychiatrist in there. Hey, look, in hindsight, could I have done something? I'm sure I could always improve, but think about why I was removed. 
to keep government open. What did we just do a week ago with the new speaker? Keep government open. Yeah, are, so, you surprised, so, are you surprised that, 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 I mean, Johnson did basically the same thing you were doing. It was the right thing to do. But, okay, if you want that day, I'll give you an insight to the story. So, and tell me if this is too inside baseball. If it bothers you, I won't do it. Um, I had told Hakeem, I had called him the Democratic Hakeem leader. Hakeem Jeffries. Who, when I became leader, I said to Hakeem, I want to treat you the way I wanted to be treated. Because I think Washington is broken for both sides. And we've gotten to a really bad place where members didn't have to show up. And what happens is, it doesn't matter what party you're in. You run because you want to legislate. But you have to understand politics to get elected. So if you start denying people the ability to legislate, they play more politics. So I wanted to take the politics down, bring more legislation up, right? So I would focus on different issues. I tried to do more things together. I would never allow the Capitol Police, if they're going to give me a briefing of something happening, I said, no, I want Hakeem in the room with me. We'd meet every week. We'd work on different things. And so I call him on Thursday and say, look, this isn't working. I'm not going to shut the government down. Why don't you and I do a continuing resolution? But to be fair, in this continuing resolution, I was going to take the Ukraine money out, because we had $9 billion, This was only $6 billion, And I was going to utilize that when we did border, and it would come next. And it'd be just clean. And he kind of ignored me, right? So I called another former... Ignored you mean ghosting you on the phone? What do you mean? Yeah, ignored? ghosting me on the phone. So I called a former leadership person in the Democratic Party, and I told him what I was doing, and he goes, I'll go down and see Hakeem. So he sees Hakeem. And so then Hakeem comes and talks to me about it and says, well, I don't think the White House would want this. And then I go and do our conference, and at the, I post the bill at the end of the night because i got to get enough time, and then his chief of staff calls my chief of staff and says, we might want to do this. We're going to go to the White House, and we're going to talk to him around 11 o'clock, and we're going to see if, um, if they're okay if we do this. So I go into our conference that day, and it's just crazy, crazy. People all different positions with all different ideas. And as I'm sitting in the conference, I tell my chief, go call his chief and see what he's found out. Well, when she checks his chief and she goes, I, I realize you're off campus. He goes, what do you mean off campus? Well, you're meeting at the White House. He goes, what meeting? Well, he wasn't being honest with us. He was trying to delay us because the Senate was going to roll us. So I decide there in conference, I'm just going to put the bill on the floor because it's the right thing to do. If I'm going to go down in history of right. a shutdown, I'm not going to shut down. And I walk out to the press and I say, there has to be an adult in the room and I'm going to pay the troops. I walk into my office. Patrick McHenry, this other congressman, a good friend of mine, he walks on the other couch. He looks at me and he does this long pause and he says, well, maybe I can negotiate you could stay till Christmas. Right? And I look at the TV and I'm thinking I'm only going to get 60 votes. And then I call the Senate Republicans soon, and I say, can you guys delay? Because I think if I get the vote on this, we'll win. And that's the end of the day. So you knew it. It was, I knew it in August they were going to come after me. Let me ask you this, this and this is just about the Republican Party at, at this moment, and also your control when you were leader. And, and I'm just curious how you think about it. You know, when you look back at, at Boehner's time, mm -hmm. for example, you know, there were people in that party, and I'm thinking of Christopher Lee, I don't know if you remember he resigned over a suggestive photo in the same day that it was released. Mm -hmm. Boehner got him on the phone and said, we're, just, we're not doing this. We're just not having this. There are a lot of people uh, that I think you think, as you said, need meds or other things that you probably don't think should be uh, in Congress right now. On both sides. On both sides, but I'm talking about your side. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you could have done a different kind of job to actually get some of these people uh, to be able to persuade them in the way that Boehner or others did in the past. And I, I just think... Are talking I, about Santos? I'm thinking about George Santos. This is um, a good discussion. This is a good discussion. No, so here's... Uh, let me just add this. And this is the thing I think America is looking at. And we can... We can there, there, are, there are people on both sides, but I'm just going to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about your party for a second, right? So we all watched... I would social, like you to join our party. Okay. We, 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 we asked... Uh, you know, we all watched uh, uh, Senator Mullen... Uh, recently, he's a former MMA fighter. You know, he's, he's about to, like, go after a, a teamster, like, physically, like, battle a teamster, right? Uh, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene is, is calling other senators, you know, uh, or congresspeople, you know, uh, something that rhymes with witch that starts with a B on the floor uh, of, of Congress. I mean, I think people in America go, what is going on? Oh, I don't know. Do you think that people in America go, what is going on? Or do they say, this is what we want? 
I think there's a combination of that. And you think the, they want, this, this no, is what America look, wants? America doesn't look and want that, but does America do it at the same time? If you look, look, it, we can always improve. And let me give you my philosophy, and, and we should have this DeSantos discussion. I look at it like this, and I may be rudimentary. The, the Senate is like a country club. You ever go to the Senate, there's not a lot of people there. It's very pristine. And the House is like eating breakfast at a truck stop, okay? We are a microcosm, but in, in reality, that's the way the founders drove it, right? The House can switch in one election cycle, and it should, and the Senate's every six years, so it's supposed to cool down more grandfathering. The Santos question is a good question, right? But this, this comes up in different times. So, Santos runs for office the time before and comes close, but no one does much research on him. The second time he runs, redistricting happens, changes in New York, runs, and I personally tried to get somebody else into the race, but he had already kind of locked down. You couldn't beat him. I go up and do a fundraiser for him, as I'm doing for everyone, and I, I listen to him, and I walk back, and I just say, we shouldn't fund this race. I don't know what it is, but we shouldn't fund this race. We don't fund the race, if you look at our super PAC. The Democrats dropped $2 million. And I'll tell you something else nobody knows. So uh, a couple days before the election, um, I'm just having a meeting with Dana Perino, and um, um, who she does her show with? On Fox. Yeah. Why am I forgetting? Yeah, Bill Hammer, who's fabulous, who studies every race. And they're asking me about this race, if we'd win or lose. I'm walking through making predictions. And I say, I don't know, we might win it, but I want to make one prediction to you. Within one year, something's going to come out on this guy. And I don't know what it is, but it's just my gut feeling, right? So then when it comes out, I'm in a position of speaker. What do I do? I don't know what's true and what's not true, but I also know we live in America and you have to have a due process. So if I removed him from office because he lied, what lie equals removal and what lie doesn't? Because we wouldn't have anybody in office. <laughs> so I sent it to ethics. That's why. Because I think you have to still have due process in the world, and I think it has to be fair in where we go. But now ethics has come back. But you so, don't think you could have done a, a different or better job with some of these people who say these things that I think Americans look at and think this is crazy. Okay, I'm not in the Senate. Um, what in the House could we have done better? Can, can I control people's thoughts? Can I control people? I have people saying on both sides of the aisle. I have, um, if, if you want to take Marjorie Taylor Greene and you look at when she entered and the process and the work of what she did when I was speaker, I said I did a pretty dang good job. Let me ask you this, a different question. Former President Trump, mm -hmm. we did not hear from, when you were, when you were ousted, mm -hmm. did you expect him to support you publicly? No. Because he did not. I, look, what, what is your relationship like with him now? I have an interesting relationship with Trump. I do not criticize him on television because I don't think it's right, and I, I know it drives him crazy. And I don't know I'll have any influence if you do that. But my personal conversations with him, we have very clear personal conversations on where we go and where we're at. He's his own person. But you have said publicly that you would, you would vote for him if he is the candidate. Well, yeah, America would be stronger. America would be stronger. Yeah. We wouldn't have inflation. My gas price would be lower. The border would be secure. Europe wouldn't look like it is today. We're going to have the vice president here later, and she's going to, she's going to talk about what she you want, Hold on, wait, wait, one second. Okay. Andrew and I were, 2016, we're at Yellowstone at this other retreat. It's made up of a lot of people. And do you remember this? And so they asked me to talk at lunch, and it's out at that. We were out in a tent area. Okay. And you know the, the, the retreat I'm talking about. Yeah. And they make me talk about politics. And I was probably the only person in the room that was a Republican or within a handful and this group is very influential, but I don't think they were on the outside world. And they asked me to tell a prediction, and I predicted Trump would win. Not because I thought, okay, he's going to win on this, but because of where the country was at. I will tell you today, if Biden is the Democrat nominee, Trump will win, and Republicans will have a very big night. But, but just try to justify this. So after January 6th, yes. and, and you know it because it was on tape and it became a big issue, you said, I've had it with this guy. You said that what happened was atrocious and totally wrong. You faulted the president for inciting people to do that. 
And so I, I'm trying to square in my brain mm -hmm. how you have those feelings about him at that time and say, I think he would be a, a great president today. I didn't say a great president. I said he'd be a better president than what we're having. I said the country would be in a better place. You, you, you study economics every day. You're going to tell me the economics today are better than it was four years ago? Let me ask you, you've spent time with President Biden recently. Yes. As you were dealing with this negotiation? With the dead I spent time with him when he was vice president. Okay. What was that experience like, most recently? With which one? In debt the ceiling? The negotiation of the debt ceiling. I think the debt ceiling was successful for the whole country. I think the debt ceiling will go down as um, one of the best ones we have done in the past. Um, he's not the same person he was when he was vice president. We know that. He has good staff. He has staff that is very professional. And I dealt with the staff, and we worked out a very good bill. And at the end of the okay. day, he agreed. You, to you just said something which I think is on the, the minds of all Americans, which is the, I think you're alluding to the age of the president. I'm not alluding. He is old. <laughs> no, was, well, look, all, do, all, okay. all respect you. I, I'm, not, I'm not downgrading the person. I've dealt with President Biden when he was vice president. I used to go to the vice president's house, and we would meet together. Um, I went and met with the vice president when I came back from Ukraine in 2015, trying to get him to sell javelins. It, it, we all know this. He can't fix his biggest problem. And it, it's not just his problem. It's a problem for the country as a whole with all of our leaders. I think the country, there's a subliminal discussion that we're not having out front, okay? In the 1960s, we made a fundamental decision that as a nation, we're going to start electing people in our 40s and 50s. You just had a great discussion here with Jamie Dimon. You said he was 67. Do you think his board's going to say, let's keep him up when he's 81? I mean... This is the but that's leader not any different with, 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 with former President Trump. Oh, okay. Do, we know the difference. Nancy Pelosi's 82. She's much more with it than Biden is, and she could still go with it. Trump, I don't see any slowing in Trump. That guy has always only been four hours. That guy works 24 hours a day. You might not like his decisions at the end of the day, but he works. Um, with Biden, I did not negotiate the debt ceiling with Biden. I could not negotiate the debt ceiling with Biden. What do you he mean? Could, Explain that. It was policy. It was certain decisions. He talked from cards. Give me, I'll give you a couple di examples. I was at a difficulty because I had a five-seat majority. I had 20 people who've never voted for a debt ceiling. I went in to see the president in February. I sat down with him and said, let's do this differently. Let's not go to the last minute to do the debt ceiling. Why don't you and I sit and talk and let's work this out so the country doesn't have to do that. And we kind of rammed around. He said he was going to do it. Schumer then comes in and says, don't do anything with Kevin. He can't pass anything. And then I went for 97 days. I went to the media every day. And it wasn't until I passed something that he could start negotiating. But when I would sit down and if I wanted to talk work requirements, if I wanted to talk what we would cut, if I wanted to talk NEPA reform, if I wanted to talk... He's, if it's not on the card, we're not talking about it. And when I disagreed with on the card, his whole point to me would always be, I need more money. But you're explicitly saying you think he's not with it. I'm explicitly saying if I had a choice of who I would pick, if I was a Democrat, to be my nominee, to run the greatest country in the world, I would not give him a, I would not reelect him. I do not think if you're waking up at 10 in the morning and you're the speaker, I mean, if you're the president of the United States and Israel goes to war and you put a lid on it, think about it for one minute. We didn't have a speaker. I went out and did a press conference simply because I did not think our nation should sit back at a moment in time. Israel is at war. You've got Jamie Dimon is right. This is like the 1930s right now. What happens in the next couple months could send us into World War III, and the leader of the free world says there's a lid. I don't care what party you're in. If you can't speak, if you can't deliver in any given moment at the minute of president, then you and the family have to have that discussion that it's not the best time for you there. I mean, let me ask you a different question. Assuming Trump is the nominee, mm -hmm. Who should he choose as his running mate? The New York Times actually ran a story on the front, uh, on the front of the NY Times recently about this. Of the options, Tucker Carlson, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, Ramaswamy, your friend Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mm -hmm. 
Who, who do you think would be uh, the right person? Okay, if I was a political person <laughs> and I was going to advise somebody, you're going to pick the vice president that's about addition, not subtraction. So you're not going to pick somebody that already equates to you. In the past, you'd pick it based upon a state. That doesn't seem to work anymore. Okay, the Republican Party and the Democrat Party are a little different than they have been in the past, right? We're a couple parties within ourselves. So, Tim Scott would be a great selection, and you've got to pick somebody who do the job. And truth be known, Tim's one of my best friends, and Tim, I think Tim would be great. Now, if I was picking for purely political decisions, what it looks like today is the anti-Trump vote is going to Nikki Haley. If it ended up, and you, why did he pick Mike Pence at the time? Midwest, he needed evangelicals, it added to him, there were questions, and it, it put the market together. If I, if I was Trump's campaign, and the first thing, if you know, you're not going to win if you just get all the Republicans. You need Republicans and independents, too. And if all the people who are in your party and they say they won't vote for you and they're voting for one person, if that person is with you, maybe they would be with you, too. So I would select, and that's at this moment, at this time, but I would select the person. Who's that person? Well, right now, it would be Nikki Haley, in my view. And... But the question is, who you select, will they serve? So that's another question you have to have. And it's about addition. And look, Do you think she would serve? It's, Nikki's, it's up to Nikki. But this is, this is a bigger question for Trump. If his campaign is about renew, rebuild, and restore, he'll win. If it's about revenge, he'll lose. That's the only person that's going to determine not, that is not his campaign ad, is him. And so the country is hungry, and they're open, and he has the window. Let me, let me ask you a different question. Uh, you've talked about the age, actually, of both of these presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, you happen to be pals with Gavin Newsom. Mm -hmm. What do you think of Well, that? we're... Are you not pals? What do you think? Oh, no, we're Wasn't pals, there a great story? I thought you and Gavin Newsom and Trump were all oh, together okay. in California. See... Lots of times, the media drives only certain stories of Trump. I've seen Trump in different places that you should hear about. And I don't know if it would change your opinion, but you might say, okay. So President Trump and I go out to California. There's this horrendous fire, the Paradise Fire, and it, it destroyed this area. And I don't know the exact date, but it's after November. So Gavin has won the governorship but hasn't been sworn in yet. So we land up in Northern California. We have Governor Brown. We have Gavin Newsom. And we tour. And we have good discussions. And unbeknownst to what Gavin will tell you, Gavin has a pretty good relationship with Trump because the pandemic, the pandemic had hit at this time. Yeah. I had partnered them together. Trump put the ship out. And the one thing people don't know about Trump, um, if you would just talk to him, he would engage. He didn't care what party you're in. So the interesting thing, so we tour this, but there was also a fire in Southern California, and I could get it wrong, maybe it's Malibu or something, but it was a bad fire. So we're going to go down to see that. So we put Gavin and Jerry Brown on Air Force One. I'm assuming they've flown on this plane many times. They've never been on Air Force One. Jerry Brown ran against Clinton, never got to there. And, and Trump is always like that hotel owner. He's worried about what you're eating. Whenever I'd be on Air Force One with other presidents, they put you way in the back. The first time I flew with Trump, the first time I had him, he walks all the way in the back and says, why is Kevin back here? I said, well, this is where we sit. He goes, no, 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 no. He takes you up. And, it, and if you haven't been on Air Force One, it's just like the movie Air If Force. you haven't been on Air Force so, One. So, right. <laughs> this, yeah. He would, put us, he would put us in the conference room, right? So I could probably destroy these two Democrats. You know, we have pictures all in there. And he's taking you through the bedroom. He, he'd show you everything. But so we're in the car. We go to Southern California. And we're in the car, and it's a, it's in this armored car, so it's not very good. And it's Gavin and I in the back, and we're taller. And it's Jerry Brown and uh, Governor Brown and 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 the president. They're, we're having great discussions. And and President Trump goes to Gavin because I really met in person. He goes, "Yeah, Gavin." He goes at the rallies. I bring your name up, and ah, oh, the crowd goes wild, you know. And now we've been working on this, and. We do, I don't know if I could bring your name up anymore. You know what Gavin does? No, 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 no. Please, please, keep bringing it up. <laughs> but another story I would tell you about Trump. And th these are certain things. Like I went out during the horrendous shooting in Vegas. If you see how he interacts with people on a personal level in a tragedy, um, 
I remember we, were, we went up to New Hampshire to do this rally, and two of our Marines got killed. Let me can I just ask you, and this is the part that I, I don't understand about your, your view of Trump. You have people like General Mattis. You have, you have so many people who were in with him who he has either publicly criticized or they have now said, this person cannot be the president, could mm -hmm. never be the president. And they saw the same character that you saw. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how, do you, how do you square that? Okay. You, you assume, one, even as speaker, I don't get to pick who gets to be president. As former speaker, I don't get to pick who's president. America gets to pick who the nominees are. Right, but you're saying so at that the end of the day, I get a choice between Trump and Biden. That is not a hard choice for me. That's not a hard choice. As speaker, I traveled the world. I'm going to tell you, for everyone who voted because they thought Biden was going to make America more respected around the world, that's not true. Um, I will tell you this. I was with this person, President Trump, in Mar-a-Lago when he made the decision to take out Saul Mali. Mm -hmm. I was with them when we were sitting and eating, and they walked in, and we went up to the skiff to identify it. And I know the world was a better place based upon that decision. I know he would make a tough decision in a time to make the world safer in the future place. I do know there was no war in Europe. I do know in, in North Korea they weren't testing missiles um, at that time. I do know our economy was better because our energy was lower. What about the feeling in the country? The polarization in the country? Yeah. Do you think it's more polarized today than it was then? Then and now? Um, it's still very polarized. I mean, we just removed the first speaker ever. I mean, um, it, it's polarized, yes, but it's not. Listen, we elected our last two presidents voting, f voting against a person instead of for a person. I think presidential elections are inspirational. And what America needs to heal, we play. But it sounds like you're voting. At, you're not voting for the person you want. You're voting for the person you don't want. No, I'm not voting. I'm or you're, you're, you're voting for the, for the, I'm voting for the, the, the best that would option of, the le of what you think is the best option of people that you think are either great options. That's what you're sort of saying. Yeah. But listen, at the end of the day, America has to stop putting politics into everything we do. We watch TV stations based upon our political beliefs, and we don't get news, we get opinion. We, we change our opinion when it comes to a vaccine based upon who's in office. We drive ourselves to this place. What we fundamentally need is to have an open discussion about what are our biggest challenges. I look in a macro and micro world, and who has the best plan to solve it. And if I have a decision where America went out and made a decision, these are the two people who can sit and be president, I know, what, I know, based upon what I know, is one is much more better to get the job and put us in a stronger position for everybody than the other. We're going to run out of time, so I just have two very quick questions. Yes. Uh, on December 8th is the filing deadline. For California. For the state of California. Yeah. About whether you, sir, are going to seek re-election. Yeah. That is literally in less than, a, basically a little over a week from now. Yes. And, and what's, to the, what's file, the answer? To file, you have to pull your papers. I pulled my papers. And it's a, it's a serious decision to make. And I have, I have another week or so to decide, because if I decide to run again, I have to know in my heart I'm giving 110%. I have to know that I want to do that. I also have to know if I'm going to walk away, that I'm going to be fine with walking away. And so I'm really taking this time now. What's the thing that would, that would change it for you, one way or the other? What's the tipping point? Uh, I don't think it's a tipping point. I think it's a gut call as you're trying to get I comfortable with not going back to Washington. You're trying to get comfortable with going back to Washington. What's the no, I'm still going to I'd be involved with whether I do. Could I be as effective as I need to be? Look, if you just got thrown out a speaker, you'd go through a different stages, would you not? And then you got to turn around and make a decision. I don't want to be a jerk back in. I want to be productive. I want I want I want to know um, that it's the right thing to do. And then if I'm walking away from something that I spent two decades at, I don't want to look back and say I made an emotional decision. If, so I'm going to take the time to make the right decision for my district and for myself. If you don't return to Washington, what mm -hmm. would you do? What would I do? What would you want to do? There's a lot of I don't know. Maybe things. there are people in the room who want to hire you. There's a lot what, of what would you want to do? I would like to do. There's a lot of things I'd like to do. Um, there's a couple things that are happening that I think 
could be fortified. Look, I didn't get to Washington because I'm an attorney. I don't come from wealth. I'm, I'm fortunate, right? I grew up in a house that my father was a firefighter to move furniture on his days off. They didn't have money to send me to college, so I went, I went to junior college. I'd buy beer at a liquor store. They'd sell it to me underage that had a car dealer's license. So I gave the guy 100 bucks to take me to the L.A. car auctions, and I bought and sold cars and flipped them to pay my way through college. It was illegal, but I didn't know it while I was doing it, all right? So what I did on the weekends, I went to visit my buddies who were away at college. My best friend was running back at Stanford, SC, and San Diego State. So I'm going to go to San Diego State this weekend. So I go to the grocery store to cash a check the day before the lottery started in California. So as I cash a check, I buy a lottery ticket. And I won the lottery. I'm one of the first winners. Don't think of millions. But it's 1985. It's How much you win? $5,000 in most you win. But this was before Biden economics, so it was real money, okay? <laughs> so put yourself out. You're 20 years old. It's Friday night. You just won $5,000. You, you go spend the weekend 10 minutes from Tijuana, right? So I come back. <clears throat> I take my folks to dinner. Give my brother and sister each 100 bucks. I take the majority of the rest of the money. You know what I do? I put it in one stock. I love to take risks. I make 30% of my money in six weeks. Semester comes, so I decide to take a break. So I go out and I try to buy a franchise, but no one will sell me one because I'm 20 years old. Another thing you'll be learned about me is I never give up. So I open my own deli. Three lessons I learned. First to work, last to leave, last to be paid. But I do really well. So in the two years, I now have enough money. I could pay my whole way through college. I wouldn't have to work. And no one in my family this time had finished a four-year degree. So I sell my business. I'm going to college. I open up the local paper. It says be a summer intern in Washington, D.C. with my local congressman. I don't know this man, but I think, how lucky would he be to have me, right? <laughs> so I apply. You know what he does? He turns me down. You want to know the end of the story? I now sit in the seat and got elected to that I couldn't get an internship for and became the 55th Speaker of the House. So one thing instilled in me, any job you do, no matter how small it is, excel at it, and there'll be another opportunity. So I love entrepreneurship. I think we're living in an unbelievable age. This is, this is an opportunity we have. AI is going to transform every element of our life, from government, from medicine, for everything else. We watched what happened with the Internet. Government was too slow. We know, in my view, China is never going to let the private sector have AI because they'll take over government. Europe is going to regulate it. America is going to be the wild, wild west. We have some companies that are successful, but they now don't want a monopoly, so others can't do it. Government's too slow behind. I'd prepared a long time to be speaker. MIT teaches a course in AI and quantum for generals in our military. I went there two years ago. I had them develop a course to teach Congress. I changed the Intel Committee because I make the Republicans and Democrats go there. I bring MIT. I don't want us to write a bill based upon political rounds. We need to write legislation that lets AI foster at the same time, so, protections. So if I decide to stay, those are things I work on. If I decide to go, I think that's an area I'll work on. Kevin McCarthy, everybody. Thank you very, very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you.